Showing a little bit too much there. What the hell is this waiting room? Colin. There he is. Hey, Colin. Can you hear me? Uh, I see you talking, but I don't. Uh, there we go. I had to unmute myself. Oh, good. I'm so glad I was on your side. No. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants that struggle. I know. Like, especially now. It's like, let's just take things easy. Um, no all right, let me just tell you right now, um, I'm going to count it down and then we're on. All right. So no, no, no chatting right now. To... No, 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 no small talk. No, no, uh, no, no little, little um, you know, uh, pillow talk here. Three, two, one. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Multifamily Investing Academy podcast with me, Charles Dobbins, your host, the multifamily attorney. And today I have Colin. Colin, help me with the last name. Douthwit? Douthwit. What is it? Douthwit. Douthwit. Yes. O-U-T-H, just like every other O-U-T-H word. Okay. <laughs> it's a tough one. It's a tough one. We get a lot I of- I know. I looked at it at the, like, my first thought was, okay, well, with a name like Colin, he's got to be, I got a little bit of a, like, you know, Gaelic, a little Scottish or something in him. And then, then that last name, I, 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 it just threw me for a loop. And I'm a, I, you know, you ask anybody, I'm, I'm all about the last name. I try to put you in categories based upon your last name. All right. Name. It's, a, it, it's a good British last name. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, as an Irishman, I, uh, I don't really think there are any good uh, English, uh, good last names. Just kidding. Uh, I'm, just... I'm just pretty much a mud American. So at this point, I'm kind of just invested in America. Oh, well, where'd you, listen, where did you play football? Uh, University of Missouri Rolla, a Division II school, South Central Missouri, uh, okay. just almost all engineers. So 90% 90, okay, okay. 90 engineers. Because so. I got to tell you, I don't know what it is about Kansas City, but – you are the third person on my podcast from Kansas City. Uh, my brother lives in Kansas City. Uh, he's a professor at UMKC, as a matter of fact. Okay, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I got the looks in the family. He, he got the brains. And, uh, <laughs> and then my sister says, well, I got both. So yeah, I got, <laughs> she's, she's right. Um, but uh, so was Kansas City where you grew up? Yeah, yeah. I grew up on the Kansas side, actually. Uh, southern. The, on the, did you go to Rockhurst? No, I did not. I went to public high school. Oh, okay. You couldn't get yeah. in. I see. I understand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I couldn't get in. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, we grew up uh, uh, on the far south side of Kansas City in, in, uh, in Johnson County area. And then uh, from there, went to Rolla in Missouri. And I live in Missouri now. And that's where my business is on the Missouri side of Kansas City. Yeah. Because like, is the Kansas side like the rich side? Yeah. That's kind of the area that I grew up in. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah. it is, it is kind of the nice side, like right on, over the border. Yeah. Right over the border on the South side of Kansas city. That's there's, there's a lot of the wealth is um, there's, there's some new area like Lee summits growing up in the, on the Missouri side. That's also um, getting a lot of the new young professionals are moving over there as the Johnson County Overland Park Leewood area is getting really built out. Yeah. Uh, Overland Park. That's the name. Yeah. That's the, yeah, that's the big fancy place to, to live when you're in Kansas city. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. So, uh, yeah, well, I lost my brother to Kansas city. So, you know, and hey, let me ask you, do you know my, 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 um, uh, some of my past clients or what have you, uh, do you know, uh, Paul Worcester? Names familiar. We haven't crossed paths yet though. Okay. Well then you got to go back and listen to my, uh, one of my last podcasts where I had Paul Worcester on, you will love it. And he's, okay. a, he owned uh, 3000 units in Kansas city. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then how about, how about one of my old clients, uh, color spent a uh, Spencer color. I don't know him. Oh man, you got to get out more often. Well, we uh, we're pretty connected, but I've only been in this game for about three years in Kansas City. Okay, okay, all right. Well, let's talk about the game, okay? Mm -hmm. Because you know you, your background was in engineering, so uh, you know. Uh, let me just tell you something about engineers. Um, when I was in the insurance business, when I was in the life insurance business back when I first got out of college, and you'd get leads in. Uh, you know, and the, uh, you sit around the bullpen with all the other insurance agents all trying to make a buck. And, uh, you know, you get a lead in from an engineer. You know what we would do with that lead? <laughs> we'd just throw it in the trash. Throw, just the throw trash. it right in the trash. <laughs> yeah. And if it was an Indian engineer, we'd burn it. Like, forget it. You just can't <laughs> sell those guys. They just analyze everything to death. And, you know, they, ne they never make a decision. So <laughs> you uh, started out as an engineer. Now, what type of engineer were you? Uh, civil structural engineer. Uh, okay. And then did my master's in engineering management. So really just got into project management at the end of the day. 
for okay so so when you say um uh civil engineering did, did, were you doing like site work uh you know yeah i worked for a general contractor for okay. a while that did uh we did road and bridge and site development you so, did huh mm -hmm. okay Worked for k dot mo dot and then site development so okay all mm -hmm. right now after about seven years, I mean, that was a short career in engineering. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I got, uh, I really always had the kind of the entrepreneurial bug, wanted to yeah. do something and the corporate world really wasn't a good fit for me. Uh, you know, some butting heads with bosses, uh, just, you know, yeah, and then yeah, my last, I can tell just by looking at you, you look like a troublemaker. Yeah. I'm pretty honorary when it gets down to it, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we just, uh, the corporate world just, it really wasn't for me. I just didn't, I didn't like it a whole lot. Uh, you know, I always kind of want to do, do my own thing, put my own processes in place, you know, try to improve on things. But sometimes these uh, larger companies don't always want that. And so I was under contract on my first property, uh, which was a seven unit building in the town that I live in. Okay. And uh, I got fired. Yeah. And, and more, I said, you know what? Company the mortgage company loves to see that happen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you can only milk the last two months' pay stubs for so long yeah. uh, <laughs> before they want to see an update. Before like, they're like, well, this one's three months old. You know, we did. Uh, so after, yeah, I got let go. I closed on that first property, and then um, just was like, you know what? I'm going to see if I can make a run at it without going back. We had some money saved, set aside. Um, my wife was employed. Um, we. It always kept our expenses really low because I always knew I wanted to get out and start my own things. So I didn't want yeah. to have an excessively large mortgage, debt on cars, et cetera, et cetera. So we did, we made a run at that and uh, we were able to, to, to get it done. Um, Good. No, that was Good. three, three and a half years ago. Okay. So that was your first deal right, right there. And, and it was, mm -hmm. you know, was it owner occupied? Did you move no. in? Okay. No, no, no. We didn't move in. We, we live out uh, in a small town uh, about 30 minutes outside of Kansas City. We live in the country. So okay. we stayed out, the, stayed out on the farm. And, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you farm boys. All right. Now, um, what happened next? You're scared. Okay. Let, let's talk about like how, how you're feeling now because you lost your job. You just took on a mortgage. Prob property in Kansas City, Property is probably cash flowing. And so you're okay in that regard. But but now, like, what do you do? So I had a fortunate slash unfortunate thing happen about 18 months before that happened. My father had passed away. So oh, I, had, so I, had, I had a nest that egg. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, we had about $120,000 from his life insurance policy yep. uh, that, that we were working with. And so that was, a, that was my nest egg. You know, um, I knew that I had been wanting to do that for a while. And so, you know, as unfortunate as that was, that was my nest egg to get started. Uh, so a, a blessing, uh, you know, tempered with something, with something bad. Um, so we use that. And my goal was to not ever dip into that for our, our living expenses. Oh, good for just, you. Just to use that for investing. You know, we didn't spend it on anything frivolous, didn't go buy new cars, anything like that. Like that was purely for real estate. That's the right thing to do because I, I listen. I get my nest egg all set up, and I'm using it just to invest in. You don't use the the equation is income less expenses equals a profit, not assets less expenses equals profit. That's mm -hmm. not how it works. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so yeah, I I never really was super scared at that point. Um, yeah. You know, I was actually I I was really unhappy with where we were at, and when I was told that I was let go, uh, I was. I was driving home and called my wife and was like, I feel like this weight's been lifted off my shoulders, exactly. this burden, this exactly. stress. Because every time yeah. my boss called on a phone, it was like a mini anxiety attack. Yeah. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, so we just did that. Uh, we used that nest egg to invest in a few more properties, uh, started a partnership. Uh, and then, you know, at about 12 months in, we had spent about as much money as we wanted to. And so then we started looking for more partners or people to, uh, you know, come in and, and lend the down payment as well, right? So we can essentially yeah. get 100% financing on that and give some yep. good terms to them. Uh, you know, in, in that time, we were working to reposition properties along the way. So we uh, needed construction guys. So I started bringing on my own construction guys, you know, and paying them on a, on a project basis. Okay, so let me just ask you something. As an engineer, having all that experience as an engineer, do you, does that automatically make you qualified to own a tool belt? And to get out there and, and I mean, can you rehab? Oh, a, 
Heavens no. I can tell you how oh, it's built oh, and, okay, I could, okay. and I could tell you where everything needs to go, but my practical craftsmanship is terrible. Okay. You know, I okay. did it when we first started, when we just had our first seven unit building and I didn't have a job. You better believe it. I was out there painting units and yeah. painting light fixtures. But my biggest, one of my biggest victories was the day that I was able to take the tools out of my car. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not have them anymore. Um, so yeah, no, it doesn't qualify you for that. Engineers are notoriously good for being able to design something on paper and then have no idea how to actually put it together. Right. Right. That's why there are such things as as built surveys. Yeah, because, exactly. Or yeah. you get a, <clears throat> you have a contractor check your drawings. Like, no, you can't have three pieces of steel in one spot at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> luckily I had enough construction experience, um, enough kind of farm experience that I I'm handy enough to handle uh, those things, but I'm not, I'm not good at them by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. Okay. Good, good. So, yeah. so how did it go? And I'm going to get into, you know, you mentioned a couple of things that I'm going to really dig down deep on, but how, uh, you know, you made the transition and it isn't so much of a transition because we're ultimately going to get to your, your property <laughs> management business, mm -hmm. but, uh, that sounds like it was an evolution and out yeah. of necessity. So tell me how that all came about. This I had been toying with the idea of starting my own property management company because by the time I was up to owning 60 or 70 units, yep. I had to implement a property management software. So we got on board with, with Buildium and started using them yep. for our, our property management software. It's like, well, I'm already have the systems in place. Uh, I've spent two years managing my own properties and learning the rules, making my own mistakes on my own properties uh, you know, learning the laws, et cetera. So <clears throat> you need to have a designated broker in the state of Missouri. So I started toying with that idea, talking to um, my stepfather, who's actually a broker in Georgia. Uh, and he inevitably ended up taking the test for Missouri to be my designated broker, which was really huge of him. And I'm super appreciative of that. But what spurred that on a little bit was knowing that I wanted to get into property management. Um, I started having a discussion with a, a property management company that was uh, that was for sale. Uh, oh, interesting. And I was going to, and we were going to, we were going to purchase that one and they had 400 doors under management. I would have brought in my, my 70 doors would have been a big, you know, almost 25% bump pretty quickly to that company's, um, you know, bottom line. And so when we did that, uh, you know, we got pretty far down the process and then the deal fell apart. They, they chose to not, not sell oh, at interesting. that point. Oh. Um, so that really kind of spurred me. I was like, well, I'm going to start my own company and I'm going to grow it. And, you know, I'm going to be as big as them as soon as possible. A uh, little chip on the shoulder, no, no animosity, just a little bit of a little chip. Oh, all, all, healthy, all healthy. Yeah, all healthy, all healthy. Just pushing me to be how quickly can I be as, as, as big as I can to, to earn the income that I want to earn off of it and to justify having the employees to where I still don't have to take the tenant phone calls. Okay, let me let me clarify two things here. First off, I'm I'm loving this story because I teach all of my students that at some point you will own your own property management company. All successful investors who get really big own their own property management company. You are showing us exactly what I teach, and you're showing us exactly how you did it. Now, one thing I want to stress to people so that they understand is that you have you own seventy doors at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and you're looking to go out to, to start a property management company and you had to pull in your stepfather to get that broker mm -hmm. box checked mm -hmm. in, in uh, Missouri mm -hmm. for you to do third party property management. Correct. You need to do it for other people. Correct. You don't need to be, you don't need that requirement if you're going to uh, uh, self deal, so to speak. So Correct. Yeah. I, have a, I have a good friend uh, in, in Omaha that's also a property manager. Uh, we've got to know each other. Uh, and he manages 400 doors up there, but he has ownership stake in, in all of those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it is such a, you know, I got asked to property manage a, uh, a property when, when I had owned property out in Ohio. And I looked at the, at the rules and requirements. That broker requirement is such a barrier to entry that the real estate uh, you know, agents and brokers have, have set up in every single state mm -hmm. that it's, it's, it, it keeps everyone else from jumping into a state and, and, and you know, opening yeah. a property management company. Yeah. I mean, I really do want to get my license here soon. Uh, yeah. You know, just so that I can be my own broker down the road, but that's a two year, you know, you have to have your license for two years before that exactly. happens. Exactly. Yeah. Kansas, however, doesn't have that broker requirement. Oh, isn't that interesting? So I could jump over the state line, just submit my paperwork to the state just to get approved 
to work in there as a foreign entity, essentially. Yeah. Yep. And so now we can, we can work in Kansas and we've got, you know, quite a few properties that we manage in Kansas. So yeah, I mean, that's kind of where we started and then opened it up to third party was really what uh, took it to the next level. And that, that obviously that provides you with a nice, steady, solid uh, source of income because mm-hmm. those yeah. rents just keep coming in. Yeah. Yeah, they do. All they right. Do. Now, a couple of things. How you doing now? How's it going now, Colin? And what I mean is, for those of you just turning on this podcast, we are in quarantine mode right now. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yes. uh, it's, you know, Colin, Colin's bedroom has uh, a, a hung ceiling, a, uh, you know, a, a suspended ceiling with foam, uh, foam things. So he's obviously, uh, you know, a, a, a great, um, <laughs> he, he lives in an office. Yeah. Uh, you know, but yeah. look at mine. Look at my beautiful setup. See, I got my, my P38 model. Beautiful. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I got my. My seaplane, that's coming. Oh, that's, that's a throwback. Coming. Isn't that cool? That's yeah. Cool. yeah. That's, no, that'll yeah, be we're, an acquisition. We're in, we're in the office right now. Uh, so we are deemed an essential business. Yeah. Uh, health and safety, et cetera, et cetera, by the state of Missouri and Jackson County, Missouri. I don't know exactly what our city says, but they are kind of falling in line with, with the county and everything right. like that in the city right. or the state. Uh, so, yeah, we are, we're still working. We're still here in the office. We're still, maintenance calls are still happening. But are you only going out to do maintenance calls if they're uh, like water or fire, you know, related or? Generally, I mean, we're not going out. We're not putting, fixing a, uh, like a towel rack at the top yeah, of our yeah. priority list. But a lot of the stuff tends to be plumbing, water heater, electric or HVAC related. Those are a majority of our calls. So majority of them do tend have to get, get done anyway. Mm-hmm. How are collections going? Not as good as normal. Uh, yeah. I don't have, I don't, uh, I have to step back and say, we've had an extraordinary amount of growth in the last six months. Okay. That being said, we've brought on large chunks of multifamily properties from investors that we are in the position of, re, uh, we are in the process of repositioning. So with that, meaning we've got poor tenants already in these properties, yeah. the collections okay. were a struggle with before, plus they're transitioning to new property management, plus COVID-19 going on. Our collections were struggling just due to the fact that tenants would even call us, you know, really? because they, you know, and we were, we were getting very aggressive on our, you know, following our, uh, per our attorney's recommendations, following our, our postings and our evictions and everything like yep. that. Yep. And a couple of the big multifamilies we had just taken over, we were really getting that ramped up. And as soon as we were getting everything submitted, then the courts go and put a stay on evictions. Yeah. So, okay. you know, but we are, we're doing better than I was expecting us to do, but since we don't haven't, we have a lot better success with tenants that we've placed, not tenants that we've inherited. Okay. Okay. I'll just, I'll all right. Just that's interesting. That. Now, let me ask you this. I, I mean, we hear this, all this crap. It's usually coming out of California uh, about this <laughs> concept. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Tenant strikes. Mm-hmm. There Any... is an unfortunate, an unfortunate group of, of individuals in Kansas city that are advocating that. Yeah. I don't know how much traction they're getting. Um, they're the same group of, of people that push for a tenant bill of rights within the city of Kansas City, Missouri, which is uh, very liberal and very aggressive, very anti-landlord. Yep. Yep. Uh, and so I, I can't be a fan of that. I don't even want to say, <laughs> mention the group's name to give them any credibility. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, that's, I don't know how much traction it's going to get. I know that they're lobbying the governor to, you know, try to get a stay put on, on rents or not having to pay. I think that's a, a terrible decision unless the government decides to step in and pay for everybody's rent, which the government fiscally can't do. No. Um, because the owners still have to pay for maintenance calls. They still have to pay for insurance. Even, nice. if they're, even if they're getting a reduction in their insurance rates, you know, some people are doing 20, 25% off through their companies. Um, even if they get to stay on their mortgage, you know, get a deferment, they've, they've still got bills to pay. Associated like, with like property, property tax. Like property tax, like maintenance, like that person that's going to have the entitlement mentality that, hey, I don't have to pay my rent for two months because I've been deferred, but I expect you to come in here tomorrow and replace this hot water heater or else I'm going to file a claim with the city that you're being negligent in your management of the property. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible entitlement mentality. It's, I, don't, it's, I don't want to go down that. Uh, I know, I know, but it's so ridiculous. It's, where, where do they think it comes? Where does the government think it comes from? I mean, it, it, it's this, uh, you know, when you shut down the economy for, for 30 days, like we have, you finally get to see microeconomics in action. 
-hmm. Like when you tip that waitress the extra 20%, that ends up coming back to you in the form of her rent. Yeah. And if you, you know, she's not making it, you're not getting it. You can't, it's all a beautiful ballet. Capitalism is a beautiful ballet. Yes, it is. Uh, yes, it's it's a, it's, okay. Granted, and... it's a, it's a beautiful ballet of fat people, but it's a beautiful <laughs> ballet anyway. So, yeah. you know, it's got, yeah. So, all right. Now let, let me, I watched your video. And for those of you, like, give us your website uh, here. Um, yeah. Uh, website's www.atlas.rentals. Atlas.rentals. Wow. That's mm -hmm. pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. So you got Atlas. I got Atlas here behind me. Hang on. I got a, oh, that looks like a, the cover of the Fountainhead. Uh, well, Anne maybe Rand's. it'd be a copy of the cover of Atlas Shrugged. Oh, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. Anne Rand. Yeah. I was just gonna say, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Excellent. Probably. That was the, that was the inspiration for Atlas. Everything. So. Oh, okay, okay. That's because mm -hmm. I am John Galt. So uh, just. Oh saying. well, that's great. Yeah, I think we all are John Galt, aren't we? <laughs> when, when we're in this business, yes, we absolutely yeah. are. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Oh, yeah. No, that's uh, that's Rockefeller Center, New York City. Okay. Okay. Yep. So I'm right down there with you, Colin. I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> we read the same books. We listen to the same books. Um, listen. Exactly okay. So, right. so <laughs> I was listening to one today on the ride in. I'm like, nah, I'm not going to listen to this one again. I'm, I'm now hooked on, uh, on, um, uh, some, some, uh, anyway, I won't get into it. Let, let me ask you. <laughs> um, so we go to your website. Now, one thing you talked about on your, on your promo video is, you know, you're, your focus is to work with investors and mm -hmm. you know, that's going to include, like you said, you've got people who are looking at wholesale deals, people, uh, you know, that you've got some, uh, some off market deals. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you will kind of partner with an investor. Like for instance, uh, you know, you didn't mention it in your video and, and I, I wrote it down as something I want to talk to you, like helping a new investor through the due diligence process yeah. during the inspection. Like, let's talk about that. How, how do you get work with investors? Yeah, we are fully their partner. We're their their guy, and we don't charge for that service, the due mm -hmm. diligence. That's just something that we provide to help get them across the line so that we can help them put together a plan to execute to improve their property or get or hit their goals with that property. So, yeah, we'll go through. Um, we will help coordinate the day of the inspection, work with the, the broker if needed on that, and we are there on inspection day. We're taking photos of every unit. We're uploading those to Google Drive, sharing it with the uh, with the tenants, or excuse me, with the with the investors. Then we're analyzing the rent rolls with them. We're looking at who's behind, who do we need to get rid of, where can we increase money, where are some other value add opportunities. Um, what was the thing we did the other day? Uh, you know, we'll also do. We have a construction side too, Atlas Construction. Yeah. So then we look at how can we add value through rehab on the property to reposition the property, that sort of cool. thing. So cool. we're, we're, we're right there with them through the whole thing. Um, and then trying to say, okay, well, we really feel comfortable that your rents can get up to here. Uh, we should implement a common area maintenance fee. We need to get pet fees implemented, et cetera, et cetera. Common area maintenance fee. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's... that's our, that's our big one right now. I mean, you do that across a 50 unit complex at 20 bucks a, uh, uh, or 10 bucks a door, 15 bucks a door, you can really uh, divide that by a seven cap. You can really add some value to the property. Wow. And that's like, it's, it's just an add on. So it's not considered part of the market rent. It's just, everybody has to pay this, um, this extra fee. Yeah. Kind of like yeah. a utility, uh, a, a rubs fee. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I can't, huh. That was like, you know, I had this one property manager. Ah, oh, she was a good kid, but man, uh, we were, there were only three complexes in this town and we were the nicest complex in the town. And, um, we were at the top of the rents. We were uh -huh. the market. We were, we set the bar and I said, Hey, listen, we got 96% occupancy. Let's push the rents. Oh, we can't do that. Like, why can't we all? Oh, because we're all the higher. So if we go any higher, we're going to be the most expensive place in town. I said, I said, yeah, but we're at 96% occupancy. This is a time to drive the rents. She goes, no, no, we'll lose people. We'll lose. I said, can we charge like 25 bucks for water? She goes, oh yeah, 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 we can do that. We can do that. That's not a problem. Like, <laughs> okay, let's do that. I don't care. How you, you know, the, at the end of the day, the cap rate divides it by the same, uh, you know, uh, same dollar amount. So who yeah, cares? exactly. So working on common area maintenance, work on a utility bill back or a rubs or common making sure we got pet feed implemented, et cetera. But you know, on these, on these big multifamilies, you know, if you can get 500 bucks a month on a 50 unit, let's say, and you're mowing, 
you know, that may break even on your mowing costs. You may make money on that, but then you've got exterior lighting that you have to pay for. So it's just a way to recoup those, um, those, those salt costs. Here's, here's one that you can, you can justify it. Like if you turn a unit into one of those package rooms, package rooms are the big thing nowadays. Package for, rooms. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is, I mean, I went to a, a conference, uh, um, a, a Marcus Millichap conference, all the class A properties, the thing they have are package rooms. And it is amazing, the technology behind these package rooms. You, mm. Yeah, think about it. You got a 100 unit apartment complex, you got Amazon coming in all the time, and the, the, the people having their boxes stolen, uh, or if there's, a, if there's a guy at the front desk, he's collecting these boxes, he's got you know, all these things. They set up a package room, and here's the cool thing about it, the technology now is such that Amazon comes in, they stick a box in, in one of the lockers, they, they, um, they put the code in, and they email the recipient the code. And so the, the recipient, at the end of the day, comes to the package room, and they plug in the, the thing, and they don't even know which, which box their box is in, which, which locker their box is in. They just push the code, and the door opens, and oh, there it awesome. is. That's, Isn't that cool? Yeah. yeah. So this is so when you're talking about a common area maintenance charge, having a package room as an amenity uh, is is great for these people, and they're all paying for it out of the common area maintenance charge. Oh yeah, that's true. I like it. Yeah, no, that would be something to look at. I don't stick think we'd be calling. Properties. Stick with me. I'll carry you across this finish line, pal. So, oh yeah, no, we need to get there for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so so let me ask you this, and this is uh, you know final question, and this is. Uh, Oh, this is a bugaboo for me. And uh, uh, just between you and me, no one else is listening. Uh, <laughs> right. Let's, yeah, let's talk partnerships. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I, I always tell, I, I have a very, um, very candid uh, training on my, my membership site about partnerships. And I, I tell people that the worst situations I've ever been in, in in this business have been the result of bad partners. And so, you know, you can talk syndication, that's one thing, but then within the, 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 the uh, acquisition group, those are the people that are my true partners that have, have some of them have just totally fallen flat on their face and, and uh, mm -hmm. brought nothing to the table. So I am always very leery about partners. Uh, so, you know, uh, tell me about your situation. You, you mentioned the word partners mm -hmm. and partnerships, but what exactly do you mean by that? How did it work for you? <clears throat> so when I say partners, uh, you know, we went into that knowing that they were still working full-time jobs and I wasn't. So I was yeah. essentially the asset manager slash property manager. Yep. So, you know, I was responsible for paying, still am responsible for paying the bills and making the mortgage payments, et cetera. Et and cetera. work, but, but that's a property manager. But, but what you're talking about also are the, is the asset manager side where you're the one that has to deal with the investors. Correct. Correct. So we, with our partners, typically they've been smaller groups. They've been two or three different investors, you know, okay. so we haven't had huge 10 member partnerships or anything like that. Uh, I do have a, a syndication where I do have another partner uh, as we are the, the general partner. And then we've got a, a couple limited partners Okay, and you know, they've all been friends and, you know, frankly, in that syndication, we're not too far down the road. So it really hasn't had a chance to yeah. get the proverbial fan. Yeah, you're still in the honeymoon. Yeah. We're still in the honeymoon, but coming in with maybe a clear expectation of who's going to do what and the fact that we've got property management in place. And also since we've got the construction company, we're also coordinating rehab as needed. It really cuts out a lot of the work that may need to be done under asset management. Mm. Okay. So, so, so are these guys, they're, they're more like money partners more than, you know, cause the way that we had structured our general partnership was, mm -hmm. you know, at one point there were five of us and each one of us had a particular role. Mm -hmm. like one person's role was to raise money. Yeah. Well, guess what? They didn't raise a dime and they still got 20% of the deal of the yeah. partnership. That was just ridiculous. Uh, so, so you're still early on in the phase. Have you considered the, you know, the, the difference between a joint venture and a syndication? Uh, yeah, no, we absolutely have. And we didn't want to get into the legal portion of the syndication. When we did our, yeah, our syndication, yeah. we just ended up yeah. making it a partnership 
yeah. right? And yeah. just just formed a new a new LLC entity with that, and we had general partners and limited partners yeah. on that. Um, you know, but the expectation is is what what roles are each person going to have, right? And then you know, me and my uh, my buddy that did this most recent one, we had to raise funds, and I was like, listen, I need you to raise the majority of the funds, and you know, he came through and raised you know sixty seventy percent of the funds, so. Mm. I was like, great. That's exactly what I needed. Now that we're into operations, he's just like, how are collections doing? How is our, how are our unit turns going? And, you know, I was like, okay, but you know, I'll need you to put together the, the email, the quarterly email and calculate up distributions essentially. Yeah. And if that's all that he does, I'm okay with that because we're handling everything else operationally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you the thing that, you know, I advise all my students is to say like plan for the divorce. Mm -hmm. Let's plan for the divorce. And, yeah, uh, you know, and the beautiful thing about real estate partnerships is they only need to be one deal long mm -hmm. and then you're done. You know, I'll, I'll move on to something else. Like I'm, I'm working with a partner on, uh, on uh, a um, uh, development. We're looking to build apartments now. And so I got mm -hmm. a partner and he and I are out there looking for, looking for deals and Hey, if it works out great, we'll go do another one. If it doesn't, we shake hands and part friends. And that's, that's the extent of, of, of the partnership. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I think as long as you've got the clearly defined roles and knowing that you don't have to partner with them on everything, you know, frankly, yeah. I've got, I've got, I've got a partner that I enjoy working with. Um, but it's like, Hey, let's, let's get a couple years into this one. I know we've got some, we've had some turmoil just with dealing with the property. Let's see how we weather this storm. Yep. and then see if we still want to do another one yep. before we before we jump in five deals deep. Cool. His name is Colin Do it. Atlas dot rentals, not dot com. It's not you know the guy. He figured it out. He figured it out. I still have to figure it out. So his name is is Colin Do it, and uh, you can reach him in Kansas City. And I'll tell you right now, folks. Um, you know, and, and Colin, you're probably going to get some phone calls after this podcast just for people looking like, Hey, what do you have for off market? Hey, I'd love to come and do something. Cause I'll tell you, you're on the, you're the, you're bringing up the rear right now on my Kansas city investors group. Uh, I, and I have no idea why, uh, why this happened, but <laughs> Kansas city is a, is a great little town. And then, and the thing about Kansas city, Colin, and you know, this, the numbers work. The numbers work. We have a ton of out-of-state investors right now nice. looking at a ton of different properties. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a great city. We're very, very glad to be here at this All point. All right, man. It was a pleasure meeting with you. And, uh, you and well. stay, stay, uh, stay hunkered down, stay quarantined, because, uh, uh, you know, you got to look out for guys like me who don't wear masks in the supermarket. <laughs> You're I'm such a rebel. I know. <laughs> <laughs> who knew? Who knew? <laughs> All right, buddy. Hey, have a great day. It was good talking with you. Uh, you as well. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.